This Steve Jones Show podcast is now loading. The Steve Jones Show podcast is presented by Sunbury Motor Company, Purdy Insurance, Brewers Outlet, and NIL Game Changers. Bringing you an in-depth look at Penn State sports and more. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The Steve Jones Show is presented by Purdy Insurance, Brewers Outlet, NIL Game Changers, and Sunbury Motor Company. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. To save you money? They update because customer service means everything to them. They are great people who are great pros. All at Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. We open the show today with my good friend John Sauber from the Center Daily Times. John, first of all, how have you been? I have been delightful, Steve. I uh, actually just got back from a week of vacation, did some golfing, and can't really ask for much more. Well, congratulations, by the way, on the single-digit handicap. That's fabulous. Uh, yeah, there is uh, there is no chance that that is true. Uh, but you know, we live in the in the high twenties. Okay. Well, hey, at least you're out there having fun and doing it. Uh, That's right. Penn, Penn State had an opportunity for people to at least talk. You know, you had a chance to talk to coaches last week. Live for life happened as well. I know this all works around your vacation. But what's the general read that you get when you went through the comments that were made in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, so it was interesting. Uh, I, you know, we, we talked to James last Thursday. As you mentioned, we talked to the assistants right after that, which, like you said, was a nice little send-off before I went. But uh, I, I thought the uh, there was a lot of confidence from, from the various assistants that I spoke to in, in their specific position groups. But uh, I, it was a um, – what's the word I'm looking for it was it was rather calm though you know what I mean like there was no uh, nobody was worried about a position group nobody was expressing concern over things James was relatively run-of-the-mill wasn't wasn't you know uh, there was no major storyline coming out of anything so I thought it was a it was a really uh, it, it feels like everything is flying under the radar I guess a little bit more this off season than maybe in off seasons past and when you look at that, you know, because it was very businesslike, I think that's that's the best way I, I thought of it. Uh, yep. When you look at that and everybody is taking that kind of attitude, especially the under-the-radar part, how much does it benefit, especially now with a 12-team playoff, that you enter in a little bit under the radar? Yeah, I, I honestly think that's huge for this team this year, right, because – uh, you look at a lot of the, the main figures in, in the program this year, there are a lot of stress points and a lot of pressures that a lot of these guys are facing that if they were more under the microscope could get overwhelming, right? Like you talk about someone like Drew Aller, who was really good last year, um, and especially for a, a first-time starter, he's going into a year that it, it maybe does not make or break for him, but where people have really high expectations for him. Uh, and him in this program not being – so so pressured to uh, to to be you know one of the top four teams I think will really help uh, him and other guys on the team kind of be themselves and, and play how they play without the expectations that okay it's got to be twelve and 0, 11 and one at worst you know I, I do think a, a ten and two team will make the playoff I I said earlier this uh, this off season that I thought a nine and three team might end up making the playoffs so not having the stress of needing to win every single game of course they're going to want to of course they're going to try to but not having that as you know everything is make or break uh, I, I think will really help this program this year john how intrigued are you because the schedule is going to be different you have a ucla washington usc games they're all conference games along the way how intrigued are you by that yeah, it's it's still really strange, right? Like I look at the schedule, and I'm used to you know the Pac-12, and and you know there being a Power Five, and you look and you see those teams on the schedule, and it just feels different, right? It'll be cool, I think, uh, for fans from from Penn State, you know, and, and uh, other programs too, to see these kind of matchups. But that that first game against UCLA will be the first one for Penn State against one of these programs, uh, and I'll be curious to see what it's kind of like, right? How UCLA deals with with the cross-country travel and then how Penn State deals with it not long after that heading to USC so I think the the travel is the biggest question mark here and how it's going to impact how these teams play because we see it in the NFL but 
you know, there's there's more time to travel before a game in the NFL, right? You you have more more leeway to get out there. This is this is not really uh, like that, and it's not like bull games because bull games guys have a chance, you know, to be like for the Rose Bowl, they're they're out there for a week, right? Uh, if not more, to to adjust their body clocks to the time. This is you're in and you're out. Uh, it's a it's a business trip. Right, no question about that. Um, people have talked about the wide receivers. Uh, you know, and let's face it. I mean, it's it's a it's a proper talking talking point. How do you view them and the pressure on them heading into the season? And when you had a chance to talk to Marcus Hagens, what was your thought there? Yeah, I, I thought Marcus handled himself really well as he always does, and and he he did a good job of explaining how. Yes, they hear all that noise, right? That you mentioned that that it's this talking point. They all hear it. They're human, of course, they hear it, but they use that to motivate them right and they use it to to channel it properly and and he even talked about how he gets uh it it motivates him because he doesn't want to be talked about as like a weak point of the team or anything like that he wants to be you know one of the reasons that uh and and he wants the position group to be one of the reasons that that the program is finding success so i thought he had kind of channeled all that stuff properly uh you know, you, you, we talked to him about guys like Julian Fleming, uh, who obviously is the big addition that everyone will point to, replacing Keandre Lambert-Smith in some ways uh, as the, the veteran in the room. Uh, I'll be curious to see what his role ends up looking like, but I think there's there's no doubt that his role off the field has been pretty big. Uh, he, he mentioned when I, I sat down for a one-on-one with him that Liam Clifford has also stepped up in a leadership mm-hmm. role, but I think part of that probably happened because Fleming is facilitating that, right? He's creating a culture in that room um, that's going to be really big because they have a, a ton of talent in the room, especially younger guys that, that I think need to take a step forward. But they also have someone in, in Trey Wallace who has been really good when he's played. He's just got to stay healthy like Fleming does, and I think they have uh, you know a, a shot to be to be really impactful this year. Now, what does that mean? You know, is it putting together a thousand yard season for anyone? Probably not. But I think that you know Wallace could have a relatively big year, and, and I think could vault, uh, vault himself into you know, a uh, higher round draft status than, than he has been previously. But all in all, this group, I think, has to, uh, as a whole, improve. Everyone has to take step forward, steps forward on their own, and it can't just be one guy stepping up because then you're just drawing the attention of them and the rest of the group is still falling behind. So I think there needs to be that uh, the tide has to rise across the board and, and they have to get improvement uh, pretty much out of everyone. John, what about the coordinator part of it with Andy Koltenicki coming in, Tom Allen, Justin Lustig? That's all three coordinators. Uh, I don't know if you're looking for anything dramatic, but what are some of the subtle things that you're looking for out of uh, all three phases? Yeah, I I think with with the offense, it's how are the team's best players maximized? Uh, To me, that is Drew Allard, that is Catron Allen, that is Nick Singleton, and that's Tyler Warren and, and Trey Wallace, right? Like, those are the guys that, that you want to see put in a position to succeed if you're a Penn State fan. Uh, and I, I am assuming, based on the way that Kodal Nicky has spoken, uh, both you know in, in the availability last week and when I sat down with them, that that is the emphasis, right? It's about prioritizing the team's best players and getting the ball and giving them a chance to succeed. And I know it sounds simple and, and, and obvious, but I don't know that that's, that was always the case last year, uh, especially you know at the midpoint of the season. But I think that will be the case moving forward, and that's important. As far as the defense, uh, I, I think this is, to me anyways, a little bit more of a shift than maybe some will expect. This is, mm-hmm. to me, a, a, a true four-two-five, right? That that line position that the Tom Allen used to call the Husky when he was at Indiana is mm-hmm. more of a safety than it is a linebacker. I know it's a safety line, linebacker hybrid, but I would I would look for that position to have more safety responsibilities than, than typical linebacker ones. It would allow, it'll allow Penn State to play three best at safety uh, and move those guys around and and get their best 11 on the field uh as far as special teams i'm just i'm just interested to see you know how these things shake out with the kicker competition right like that is that you have to replace alex falcons and you need to find someone reliable out there because those those points can really matter down the stretch of games especially when when you anticipate some of these big games being close all right so you know you have people that are established in the program they're established playmakers in the program do you have a couple of guys on each side of the ball that subtly maybe under the radar that can be contributors and help make this a really successful season beyond the guys that are in the quote, the star category? Yeah, I think Caden Saunders is someone on offense, Mm -hmm. especially that, that really stands out to me, right? He came in with, with the hype, five-star talent, maybe didn't see it, uh, 
you know, turning the production right away, but you've seen improvements there, uh, especially last year. I thought there, there were flashes of him being a, a legitimate starter for this team. And he's someone in the, in the slot that can be really dynamic. He's a really good athlete uh, and is stronger. I think than, than he probably gets credit for. Uh, he's a guy on offense that I think if he takes a step forward, it can really transcend what this offense is going to do and can be really impactful. Um, as far as the defense, uh, I, KJ Winston's the obvious guy that gets all the all the attention mm-hmm. at safety as he should. He's very good. I think he's going to be a first round pick. But Zaki Wheatley is someone that I think will really benefit from playing in Tom Allen's system, right? Like I think he's he's probably that third safety and someone that can uh, you know really be a, a playmaker on the ball. Uh, you know, when it goes up, he goes and gets it, and he goes and finds it. Uh, he's he's you know not shy as a tackler either, which I think has been uh, a problem at, at safety for for different programs around the country. But I don't think Penn State has that issue at all with Winston, uh, Wheatley, and Reed. Uh, but yeah, those two guys in particular stand out to me as as they can kind of really. I, I expect them to contribute if they go from contributing to you know being a you know just below a star level player. I think he could have a big impact on Penn State this year. All right, so moving forward, money, of course, is always going to be a big part of this. Uh, we'll do this in several phases. Let's start with the Beaver Stadium expansion, or not expansion, the renovation part of it. Uh, what is your thought? Now, I know there are only a couple of renderings out there, but what's your thought on that moving forward? Yeah, I think it's desperately needed, right? Like, I, I think the, mm-hmm. the aesthetic, I know some people like the steel beams and the structure itself, but I think for a while the stadium has needed something to make it look not even more modern but more uh less like just a a construction project right like less less uh make it look more appealing quite frankly for for people that are coming into town and looking at it so uh i think that is it's it's you know desperately needed i think the we all know that the uh the improvements and the structure and everything like that are needed right like it's just got to be uh you, you know in a position where there aren't going to be maintenance needs moving forward uh, I'll be curious to see what it ends up looking like, what, what capacity ends up being, and everything like that. Uh, but I think it's it's smart to. I mean, I know not all fans will want to hear this, but I think it's probably smart to prioritize the revenue because we are heading toward revenue sharing, and, and programs are going to need increased sources of revenue moving forward. Well, you're talking about 22 million, uh, you know, just as a starting number. Uh, in the next 10 years, it could reach 30 million in terms of revenue sharing, which now brings up the next one. The NCAA basketball tournament is looking at two models right now, one to expand to 72, the other one to 76. Keep in mind that part of the House settlement is that NCAA distributions are going to be reduced somewhat to schools across the board. Is this a potential to make up for that by expanding the tournament? I think that is, uh, if not the motivating factor, it's got to be one of the motivating factors, right? I personally, I, I love the tournament. I love college basketball. Uh, I'm not one to complain about adding, you know, four to eight teams or whatever it ends up being, uh, just because it, it does increase some of that upset potential, some of the fun, some of the reason we all love March Madness. I do think it, it can get to a point where it's too much, right? I don't want to see 128 teams or anything like that in the NCAA tournament. But yeah, I think this is. You know, there are going to be things like this that we notice probably over the next few years that the NCAA does to kind of increase that revenue. We're seeing it with the, you know, with the potential for sponsorships and stadiums and logos and everything like that on, on the field. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more stuff like that moving forward. Yeah, because, I mean, look, if they were to do what the – remember the, there was the committee and they made a recommendation, and they recommended that all NCAA championships outside of the college football playoff have 25% participation. Well, in the NCAA basketball tournament, that'd be 90 schools. And I'm yep. with you, John. That's way too many. Uh, 72 to 76, I can live with it, and I can live with it for the reasons that they're talking about. And I would just say, just do 76 now, because that way you don't just mess around and then do it later. Might as well just do it right out of the gate. But that that's how I view it. Yeah, I think I think that would be uh, – it, it does feel like something that if they go to 72, that they will inevitably just go to 76 anyways. I think you're 100% right, right? Just, just uh, rip the Band-Aid off now, go to 76, and don't – you know, mess with it and realize, oh, you know, four. It, it should have been four more teams uh, than we originally planned, and then inevitably do it anyways. Uh, I think it's better to just do it right away, like you said, and, and get there and be done with it. 
Yeah, I mean, and again, that's it's all about revenue. Uh, and now we get to logos on the field. How do you feel about logos on the field, which looks like it's going to happen uh, based on what they've done? And they have not done anything yet about doing the logo on the jersey of some sort, like the NBA. Well, everybody does it. The Yankees have star insurance, for goodness sakes. Uh, you know, the the Celtics are Vista print. The Mavericks are, uh, are Chime. Uh, how do you view that in this current climate? Yeah, I think the the uh, the on the field was kind of inevitable, right? It's an it's an obvious way to to draw, draw in a lot of revenue, but not be too obstructive, right? Like I don't think we're going to see uh, them everywhere. I think the way that it's currently set out to have one big one and two kind of smaller ones is is good and, and kind of makes it more subtle and less of a, a hindrance on what you're looking at. Uh, the jersey stuff, I'm I'm kind of surprised it hasn't gotten there already. Like you yeah. said, there are professional teams doing this everywhere. Soccer's been doing this. You know, for a long time, uh, I think teams, and this is uh, probably not a consideration, but maybe it should be when, when teams agree to these things. There really should be more effort put into making sure that the color scheme of the company yes. matches your company or matches yes. your 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 own color scheme, right? Like yep. you want this to look normal and natural. I remember when the the Sixers first got the StubHub logo on theirs that you kind of didn't even notice it because it just blended right in. And so I right. think that has to be or should be a priority, at this, especially for the aesthetic of everything. Yeah, the only one I've seen that doesn't do that is Love's Truck Stops, and that's the Oklahoma yeah. City Thunder. And that's because of the big yellow heart. <laughs> like, yep. Okay. I mean, that's the one I think of. Like, okay, that's a little bold. <laughs> so. Hey, we're at that. They were. We're at that point now. That's 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 where, the, where this is. Are, how do you, just in general, John? It, this is all being mandated by court settlements. So I got that part. But how do you feel about the new model of college sports moving forward? Yeah, I think it uh, it's probably necessary at this point, right, to be in a place where um, it's treated more professionally. Because I think in some ways it's always teetered toward more professionally uh than than you know at uh than amateur especially with the amount of hours guys put in right like these and you know men and women in college sports are putting in full-time jobs right essentially as as you know when you talk about practice and treatment and training and everything like that that you're putting in a ton a ton a ton of time and so i think it was kind of inevitable for this to happen um it's probably best that it happens quickly uh, that way there's less chance for the NCA to get involved and mess things up uh, right like you can <laughs> you can kind of create a more sustainable model that 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 feels like something that can be uh, that can last for a while I am curious to see is you know transfer portals inevitably uh, the, the windows get abolished and guys can and men and women can transfer whenever they want that what it looks like when you know if someone enters the portal in say late september early october like do they join the next program right away like how does that work with scholarships and everything so i'm curious to see what it ends up looking like but yeah i think this was it was mm-hmm. especially it became increasingly clear in recent years that this was inevitable and and probably mm-hmm. the quicker the better so it can become uh so people can get adjusted right because when you when you can kind of take care of all of it at once and be like hey this is what it's going to look like i think people can then dive back in and, and understand it a little better i think we're teetering toward contracts which would prevent what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I think that's that, that's yeah. a, a, a potential here that I, I yeah. think everyone is probably monitoring at this point. Yeah, and the other part about 72 versus 76, remember, there's no Pac-12. All the major yep. conferences have expanded. That means only one automatic bid has been lost. And because of that, the power conferences are now looking at it's like, hey, wait a minute. I, you know, for example, Oregon doesn't make the NCAA tournament last year, right? Because they they want, got the automatic bid. Colorado right. would have been teetering. You may have two power conference teams that wouldn't make the tournament under the current sixty eight structure because the power five power five is now the power four and condensed. Yeah, and I think the the one thing that I have seen rightfully so get the most pushback with this is the idea of i've seen some i think it was as there's been coaches that have said that there shouldn't be automatic bids that is the one thing that should absolutely never go away with the That's NCAA right. tournament uh that is part of what makes it fun nobody wants to see 76 power four teams you know what i mean uh inevitably making the NCAA tournament we want those types of mid-majors those yeah. low majors having that shot you are so right john always a pleasure Glad you had a great vacation. Glad you took time to talk with us today. 
Thank you, Steve. I always appreciate it. John Sauber, Center Daily Times. This half hour brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street and Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com on News Radio 1070 WKOK. There's something to be said about a sale with a handshake, a service technician who really knows what he's doing. They can explain it in English what the problem is. There's nothing better than having that friend you could trust in the area. That's Sunbury Motors, where you get selection, knowledgeable salespeople, and prices that fit your budget, and more important, that friend you can trust. Welcome to Sunbury Motors, Kia, Ford, and Hyundai. You could chop other dealers and compare prices, but at Sunbury Motors, you get their lowest price promise. They research the current used vehicle market and guarantee their used car prices are the lowest. If you find a lower price, Sunbury Motors will beat it. Three dealers all in one. See their full new and pre-owned inventory at sunburymotors.com. Pick out a vehicle you like and schedule your test drive online. Follow them on Facebook. Sunbury Motors Ford and Hyundai, North 4th Street, Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Spring has sprung, and it's time to dust off those insurance policies. For over 100 years, the Purdy Insurance Agency has been protecting families and businesses of the greater Susquehanna Valley and beyond. With the experience of our trained and knowledgeable staff, you can rest assured that your needs will be evaluated and met by some of the industry's best representatives. No matter what your insurance needs are, call Purdy Insurance today at 570-286-5855 or visit our website at purdyinsurance.com to see what we can do for you. 